on to chapter two, the low road to active inference. So all chapters begin with a short quotation. And the quotation here reads, my thinking is first and last and always for the sake of my doing, William James. So even before reading the chapter, these quotations are often great places to jump off and have a discussion. So Ali, please begin and go as long as you want on the low road to active inference. Okay, uh, so uh, yes, uh, for chapter two, uh, as the title suggests, um, it's the construction of active inference theory uh, from the viewpoint of, uh, of the low road uh, um, active inference. So uh, it begins by uh, providing this notion of perception as inference, because uh, more often than not, we usually think of perception as something uh, just uh, in a computational sense of um, sense uh, is a processing of the uh, of the inputs, or uh, rather, it's a raw processing of the inputs. But uh, here it shows that uh, it can also be uh, described as, or even more accurately described, uh, as a kind of uh, inference. So it's not just a simple and raw uh, processing of the inputs, as my uh, a, a computational model uh, um, or a computer analogy might suggest. Uh, it's more um, like uh, something that we predict and then um, then we compare uh, our inputs or uh, the uh, inputs we get from uh, the, the stimuli uh, with our um, uh, prediction and then try to uh, somehow uh, minimize that uh, prediction error. So uh, I believe that this uh, notion of perception as inference is uh, the most central uh, notion of all the uh, related theories of predictive coding, predictive processing, Bayesian brain hypothesis. So uh, up to now, active inference uh, is not very different from all the other theories. It's uh, basically a subset or a variant of those theories. But then it uh, progresses uh, into uh, distinguishing uh, uh, distinguishing the active in active inference from all the other theories and how uh, it stands apart from uh, the other ones. Uh, so, uh, in, in section two point one, uh, we begin with some of the basics of uh, probability theory, namely the Bayes theorem uh, in box two point one. Uh, and uh, some simple examples uh, about how Bayes' theorem can be applied. Uh, and again, uh, a very important uh, page or important part of this uh, section uh, will be section um, page 20, which describes uh, the concept of surprisal and specifically uh, the statistical surprisal and how it differs from uh, the phenomenological surprise or psychological surprise. Uh, so, uh, and no, just, how we can formulate uh, the statistical surprise. Yes. Yes, just, just to catch up here. This example that's going to come back again and again is a person who's guessing the object that's in their hand, and it could be a frog or an apple, and the object is going to jump or not. And so that's used as a way to talk about the Bayesian updating that forms the kernel of a variety of Bayesian brain-like models, including active inference. And then um, there are the presentation of the exact Bayes. So in simple cases, you can compute exactly what you want with Bayes' theorem. However, it's a lot more effective on large data sets to use certain approximations and heuristics that we're going to be discussing. And then um, Ali has highlighted that there are two concepts that are very closely related to each other regarding surprise. There's surprise by itself, and then there's Bayesian surprise. So please pick up there. What are surprise and Bayesian surprise, and why do they matter here? Yes, yeah, so, um, well, surprise, I mean, the regular surprise, as we're all familiar with, uh, is something um, more related to our sense of surprise or psychological sense of surprise of uh, 
observing some unexpected phenomena or unexpected behavior. But Bayesian surprise or statistical surprise uh, is, uh, of course, closely related with uh, the psychological sense of surprise, but uh, a bit more rigorous uh, in which it's a way to uh, compare uh, to um, probabilistic information using uh, callback Leibler divergence uh, and uh, somehow getting uh, the, I mean, uh, how unexpected that information emerging from callback divergence uh, and uh, they call it the surprisal. So uh, surprisal is, uh, in, other, in uh, other words, is a way to formulating those unexpected uh, probabilistic information. And uh, it doesn't necessarily uh, align or maps onto perfectly our psychological sense of surprisal. But as I said, it's closely related with that. Yes. Uh, so surprise, by surprise, just, uh, yeah, please. Oh, sorry. I mean, for um, almost, yes. No, you, you, you take it, Ali. Uh, no, I was just going to say that, um, I was just going to say that uh, by surprise, um, almost uh, in the rest, all the um, other sections and chapters of the book, uh, we basically mean this Bayesian surprise uh, sense of the world. And uh, in order to distinguish that uh, with, the regular uh, sense of surprise, uh, sometimes in the literature, surprisal is used to refer to Bayesian surprise. Yes. So they're both measured in information theoretic units. This is all happening in information geometric spaces. The first concept of surprise is applied to a given single observations. How surprising is that one observation? And so in that sense, it's a lot like the z-score of a data point coming in with respect to a statistical distribution. So it's like you have a height distribution in a classroom and you measure one person, and then you can say, what is the z-score of that measurement? Was it right at the center of the distribution with a z-score of zero, or were they two standard deviations higher with a z-score of two? So it's kind of like that. And that's why there's a discussion of probability distributions and their support which is the X values for which they're defined and surprise function with the fancy I. And that's going to be a function that helps you compute how surprising each observation is given a parameterization of that distribution. Whereas this Bayesian surprise is more related to learning. It has to do with how much updating happens between the prior and the posterior and that's before and after the observation. So one could imagine a surprising observation, surprise concept one, that either does or doesn't update the prior into a very different posterior. So as Ali mentioned, they are not exactly the same, but it's going to be important to understand how they're different. And that's worked out again in the case of the apple jumping. Box 2.2 continues with a discussion of expectations. Now, expectation in everyday parlance might be specifically referring to something in the future, like I expect it to rain tomorrow. And in statistics, when we talk about the expectation, we're talking about the weighted average or the center of gravity of a distribution. And that can be in both a discrete distribution, at which point you have a weighted sum, or a continuous distribution, in which case it's an integral. So you can have an expectation for the humidity tomorrow. And so that might refer to the center of gravity at a T equals plus one, but just taken alone, expectation means center of gravity of a statistical distribution, not anticipation. Section 2.3 is going to describe how some of this how this low road that we're on is going to connect to biological inference. There's a more discussion of the generative model and the generative process and a little bit of a hint that the generative model captures aspects of the generative process, which is where we see a lot of the classical cybernetic theorems and concepts like requisite diversity, good regulator theorem, and so on. However, the generative model does not have to be exactly isomorphic with the generative process. 
for example, the generative process, the temperature in the room might be a continuous variable, but then the generative model might be discrete, only modeling integer-based temperatures, or might be categorical, like too hot, just right, and too cold. So there's a lot of articulations that can be done because of how flexible and interoperable generative models are with each other. Figure 2.2 is going to uh, expand upon that chapter one representation of the cybernetic action perception loop. And we're going to see this more in terms of a generative model and generative process articulation. And there are incoming, speaking from the perspective of the generative model, the agent, there are incoming and outgoing dependencies in this graph. And this is a little bit like a schema, more so than a formal graph, but also it is like a Bayesian graph where nodes are variables and edges are causal relationships. And so we have the internal states of the model, the external states of the generative process, and then the blanket states that make internal and external states conditionally independent. And again, speaking from the perspective of the agent, although there is a symmetry, we can talk about the incoming sensory signals happening from the observations handed from the process, passed on to the internal states of the generative model, and then the outgoing actions that are selected that then can influence the hidden state of the world. For example, going and turning on the heater to increase the temperature in the room. And so this action perception loop or particular partition is going to get explored in a lot more detail in the coming sections. Previous section 2.3 was on perception as inference, and now action as inference is going to be discussed. And that is where they say the discussion to this point is common to all Bayesian brain theories. We now introduce the simple but fundamental advance offered by active inference, which is the extension of this inferential perspective to consideration of action as inference. Perception and action cooperate to realize a single objective. Section 2.5 is about minimizing the discrepancy between the model and the world. We already described that there's two ways for this to happen. Change your mind and change the world. That's how the discrepancy can be reduced or managed. We see a variant of the action perception loop where the agent is making perceptions uh, predictive uh, uh, models of the world that through perception are being juxtaposed with observations handed from the generative process, the world, and a, a discrepancy is realized, some non-zero discrepancy. And then here are those two paths to minimize free energy, change beliefs by perception and learning, or change the world through action. Section 2.6 is going to discuss how the exact Bayesian approach described earlier is absolutely spot on if you have infinite computing resources. However, we're often interested in rapid or large data sets where we want to be able to get approximate Bayesian computation or probably approximately correct computation in a vastly accelerated fashion. And so that is going to be approached using what's called variational Bayesian inference that's unpacked in chapter four. But it suffices to say that variational Bayesian inference implies substituting two intractable quantities, the posterior probability and log model evidence with two quantities that approximate them but can be computed efficiently, the approximate posterior Q and a variational free energy. So it transforms an intractable estimation problem into a highly tractable optimization problem. Pick up from there, Ali. Uh, yes, uh, but sorry, uh, I just uh, wanted to point out a couple of things, uh, especially uh, about section 2.3, because I believe it, it is um, one of the crucial uh, sections of this chapter, and in fact, uh, the whole book, because uh, it provides some of the justifications of using uh, Bayesian inference uh, as opposed to uh, some other uh, mathematical techniques such as uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, but more important uh, than that, I uh, think it's 
this concept of optimality, which comes into play in uh, almost uh, everywhere uh, in the literature and, uh, of course, in this book. Uh, so there are actually two notions of optimality, uh, which is not discussed uh, in detail here, namely Bayesian optimality and Jane's optimality. Uh, but uh, some in some of the recent papers on Bayesian mechanics, uh, Dalton Sackley, Vadivel, Maxwell, Ramstead, and others have shown that those two uh, concepts of optimality are actually congruent with each other. So that's one of the reasons um, uh, that the duality between um, FEP, free energy principle, and constrained maximum entropy principle um, I uh, can, uh, um, I mean, uh, it's one of the justifications for uh, uh, providing that dual formalism between those two. Uh, so, uh, but another point I wanted to mention here is because I've seen that using uh, the word hidden state uh, can be a bit confusing for some people because uh, when we observe uh, something, as an observation, uh, obviously it is not quote unquote hidden, right? So what a hidden state here refers to is actually the hidden cause of that observation. So it's not that uh, the observation itself is hidden from the observation or, or it's unobserved. So that might be a bit uh, confusing uh, if, if we don't uh, take into consideration the exact meaning of the hidden state or latent state uh, here and in the rest of the literature. So uh, continuing from section 2.6, uh, here we see uh, one of the two central equations of active inference, which is equation 2.5 uh, for variational free energy. So uh, it's, uh, as I said, uh, I mean, understanding this equation and how each line of its formulation represents uh, in terms of the, uh, I mean, trade-off between energy entropy or complexity and accuracy or divergence and evidence uh, is key to uh, understanding almost everything in the uh, rest of the book and in many uh, other literature on active inference. Uh, so. This is the perceptual part of active inference. So variation-free uh, energy uh, is a parameter that uh, is a notion that parameterizes the surprisal of our uh, perceptual information we have uh, about the external states. Uh, and then we'll see in the next section uh, the related and almost symmetrical formulation to variational free energy, namely expected free energy, uh, which is basically the action part of the active inference. So we can see how those two uh, can somehow uh, be seen as a kind of unified formalism, but described in uh, alternate uh, expressions. Uh, so, uh, but Another thing about equation 2.5 is uh, it, it may be a bit, um, I don't know, daunting to see all the uh, relations between those three lines of equation and how we can get from one to the, uh, to the other. So uh, there are some uh, supplementary materials that uh, we have developed in the uh, past weeks, uh, in, in, uh, which I think uh, can help uh, in uh, clarifying how the derivations of these three lines of equation um, be done. So uh, I hope uh, it, uh, they would be uh, clarifying uh, in, uh, I mean, and help to understand how those three lines uh, relate to each other. Uh, so, but the key point here is uh, to understand that variation of free energy is not something uh, absolute, but it's just an upper bound for the minimization. So as Daniel just uh, mentioned, it's uh, untractable to have an absolute amount for the surprisal uh, to be minimized. So we need to have an upper bound uh, in order to make that more tractable, uh, because uh, 
by Jane's inequality, as uh, we we'll saw in um, we uh, chapter four, I think, uh, we can see that how the upper bound of a surprisal uh, necessarily provides a condition for minimizing the precise or uh, the exact um, free uh, the exact free energy. And uh, that's the key insight of equation 2.5, or the notion of variation of free energy, which is to provide this upper bound instead of the exact amount of surprisal to be minimized. Yeah, what I'll, what I'll add there is if you knew exactly how well you should be surprised by a given data point y, then you would have had the optimal model. However, that is not tractable. And so, by making a quantity that's always higher, or an upper bound, the variational free energy F, which is a function of broadly Q, our beliefs, our variational beliefs, which are built in a way that makes them very compositional, very optimizable, very interpretable, and data. And we can reduce the divergence, here the KL divergence with a double line, between Q, our beliefs, and P, the kind of actuality of it. And if we can reduce this divergence, in other words, minimize the free energy, then we will come closer and closer to the true surprise function and do that in a tractable, incrementally optimizable way. So equation 2.5 is going to be the variational free energy, different ways that it can be represented as it takes in data and beliefs about the world q and then this is going to be expanded into the future to include action with g the expected free energy now there's a lot more that we can say about this there's a lot of technicalities to go into but broadly notice that g the expected free energy is a functional of policy pi because it's only being evaluated to select amongst different action outcomes, pi. And another important difference is that it's going to be describing sensory outcomes that haven't yet happened. A sort of, what would I perceive if I did A or what if I did B? And it's that kind of comparison that allows the expected free energy functional here to be used in action selection or policy selection as inference, planning as inference. That section is expanded upon, and in figure 2.6, we see a very nice representation of the expected free energy equation, and then how when certain aspects of this equation or situation are zeroed out, we get certain other familiar cases. For example, where there's no epistemic value, there's no information to learn, then you get ruthless expected utility theory. And conversely, where there is no pragmatic value to extract, so all outcomes are equally valid for, or preferable, then you get things like InfoMax principle and optimal Bayesian design. And then everything in between is the space that we're interested in. And so this Figure 2.6 shows that the expected free energy functional can be seen as like a generalization of a lot of other settings related to perception and action and planning amidst uncertainty. And section 2.9 closes the low road. They took us all the way to active inference from Bayes' theorem through the generative model onto active inference and clarifies these two notions of variational free energy that's the real-time perceptual unfolding, evidence lower bound on surprisal, tractable, optimizable, and so on, and F, and G, the expected free energy, which is able to do planning as inference or policy selection as inference. Expected free energy is fundamentally prospective, and that enables counterfactual cognition. Section 2.10 summarizes active inference is the theory of how living artifacts underwrite their existence by minimizing surprise or a tractable proxy to surprise variational free energy via perception and action and they motivate that 
from a first principles Bayes theorem starting place. Any closing thoughts on chapter two, Ali? I would just humbly suggest for the people uh, who want to go through this chapter to uh, try try their best to really understand uh, specifically uh, what equation 2.5 and 2.6 uh, represents and how, uh, I mean, how to use those equations uh, to uh, describe uh, different situations with uh, some uh, missing elements as well uh, because uh, i believe those sections and uh, particularly those equations uh, are absolutely essential uh, to uh, for understanding uh, everything active inference related both in this in the rest of this book and uh, in the rest of the in in almost all Thanks. And just a last thought I'll give on chapter two is this is exactly the work that we do in the Active Inference textbook group. We really welcome all backgrounds. Every single question and uncertainty you have is beautiful. We have a lot of resources that Ali and others make to make the math approachable and rigorous and natural language descriptions of the equations and so on. So yes, it's really important to understand the equations because after all, that's like the skeleton that gives meaning to our usage and fluency of the active inference ontology, which Ali and I are speaking right now. We're not just saying surprise is related to this because we felt it that way. It, there is an underpinning and it is a really interesting life's work to explore it, but we're finding ways to communicate it and learn and teach it better and better every time. So that's chapter two, that's the low road.